Carlos, uh, as you heard, uh, Alexander was uh, mentioning digital identity uh, when he was talking. So could you explain to us a little bit what is the digital identity and how could it help to maybe get uh, the, the refugees more into the, the workforce? Thank you very much. And uh, absolutely, I think the, um, both the experience uh, demonstrated by Mohamed and, and later by Alexander on the need to reincorporate this uh, force into the economy is essential. But we are facing a problem, which is the definition itself of a digital identity. If you talk to different stakeholders, a digital identity means different things. If you talk to a government, a digital identity for them will be like a passport or nationality. Uh, if you talk to uh, Facebook, it will be a consumer or a social media advertising target. If you talk to uh, Amazon, it's a consumer, so they can buy products and so on. So digital identity, uh, when I was in the UN and after subsequently in the private sector, it is defined more as a legal identity. This is actually uh, the definition in the uh, uh, SDG 16.9, which is every single human being should have a legal identity. And a legal identity is not a passport, it's not a bank account, it is not a, um, a uh, attribute holder, it, it is actually a human identity. I organized uh, just a few weeks ago a, uh, a panel with the United Nations Commission on Human Rights, and, and our proposition was, what, what about if you insert digital identity as a human right? Because when you enter into the digital world, you're, it's, it's like you burn. I mean, when you burn, you have your uh, birth certificate, and this is uh, everybody gets one. And it is actually your birth certificate, which is used as a base document to obtain many other certifications during your life. We don't have the equivalent on entering into the internet. So refugees and disadvantaged workforces do have this obstacle because they are not able to identify themselves into the fourth industrial revolution, where, where, where the growth is going to be. So um, because they are not able to identify themselves, they cannot benefit uh, of anything. I'll give you an example. Now we are working with many NGOs on COVID vaccination. There's a lot of refugees and a lot of illegal workers, and they are not able to get a vaccination because before you get in a vaccination, you have to show your QR code, which is generated by your digital identity. So our approach is uh, very factual. I mean, I don't think you, it, this is a policy issue. The problem is that digital identity has a consumer value. Uh, Facebook makes $2 billion by selling identities and other social media companies. So we have to convert that digital identity, not as a consumer identity, but as a human identity. And every human person, regardless of its condition, geographical location, religion, or attributes should have access to that digital identity. Now, whether they use it or not, that's their problem, but it's their identity. And whatever happens to that identity should be on their consent and not on the consent of the platform. Because now if you get a digital identity from uh, you know, a platform, that platform owns that identity for you. You are able to use that, but the, it's the platform the owner. So the, that platform can one day revoke that identity for you and then you lose everything, right? If you have been using that, uh, that identity as a single sign-on to access other services. So my proposition in OISTE, when I was uh, in the UN, I, I was 20 years uh, in the UN helping building national uh, identities, which are not subject to nationalities. Uh, I know that this is this uh, 2030 goal by the United Nations, but the problem is that uh, companies are lobbying into this. They want to become the provider of the identity, with obviously for reasons that have nothing to do with this human identity uh, idea. And the only way out here is providing a free identity. And that's what we do. We, we have team with the Clinton Initiative. We provide 1 billion digital identities to 1 billion people. Those identities are provided for free. They are owned by the person and they have no farther the relation to the, uh, to the foundation. We also work with NGOs. We help them to build digital identity ecosystem. We work with schools. We work with universities for getting students to have a digital identity. And the good news is that once you have a digital identity that is yours, then you have a total new ecosystem of possibilities and it opens to you, you know, because you are uh, immediately, uh, you have a non-reputable uh, way of defining who you are. And that non-reputable way cannot be renegated, cannot be, uh, cannot be uh, uh, taken from you just because a platform will not accept. The good news is that there is an international standard. You know, ITU, the International Telecommunication Union, has a, a very 
uh, all the standard, which is X509 standards that all telcos in the world are using. And this is actually the basis standard to create a digital identity. So um, my, my, my big advice always there is that let's define first what a digital identity is. Let's develop uh, legislation at national level and international level that a digital identity should own be owned by the person and not by the platform or the technology provider. And all the data that this digital identity or service on this digital identity will be attached to it, it should be on the consent of the person. Digital consent has a huge value. A refugee, only by providing consent to access the data could be financed into crypto wallets, then you can uh, add to the digital identity into, into your mobile phone, which is actually the new, the new way of sending money, right? So um, having an identity is the beginning to be neutral, to be independent, and to be uh, free, to basically benefit from the fourth industrial revolution and all the advances and this revolution is bringing.